Hello, let's see if this is working. Right then, let's see if that's working, everyone. Right then, let's see. Oh, there's some weird flickering going on, but I'm not sure why. Hopefully you got sound, and I have no idea about the flickering. Um, that's weird. Let's see if that's better. Right then, hello, and I think I worked that one out. Uh, hi, Jerishan. Hi, Albert. Hi, Blue Shirt Buddha. Hi, Martin Doc. Hi, Kangal Gangan. Hi, Kyle Carl von Gasberg. Uh, okay, that didn't fix it. Ah, oh, that's starting to hurt my eyes. I'm not sure about you. Um... I have no idea why it's flickering. Hi, Stafford. Hi, Plebiscide. Hi, Kagan. Old Richard. Brock Payne. Hello, Brock. Hi, Jeff Beeler. Hi, Jerishan. Hi, Vice Admiral Nelson, sir. Um, old and. Hi, new IKB4472, Paul Ketchum, hello, Atrus King George V, hi, and yeah, Michael Rose, hi, I have no idea why it's flickering, I'm going to... Give me a second. Now, hopefully, hopefully, he says, that is back. How's that, everyone? Is that working now? Oh, good. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Sorry about that. This is one of the reasons why I have plans for how to improve this, you know. I have plans on 
if I can get a proper office space set up somewhere in probably will be a log cabin at this point because I don't think our roof is a sort of viable these things um, then it'll be all good uh, what I found is this camera it likes this shape it automatically sets up whenever you do a new pro a new fit a new setting on a full rectangle shape that you can expand across the screen it doesn't like supplying that it doesn't like doing it it likes doing a square shape. I have no idea why, but I live with it. As you can hear, Raleigh is currently making his presence known. The fluffy research assistant is doing his guard dog duties. And it's very important because our lovely neighbor has popped over to give, I think, my sister some butter. And, um, well, you know, she must be driven off because, you know, she's doing good deed. It's, it's terrible. All right then, looking good. Abzazi looks fine. Bye bye five. No flicky from our cable manager gets you every time. Storage cube of power. Um. <sighs> it's a case of um. How do I put this? Um. If we use a log cabin, we can also set up a. Uh, we can do a two office scenario in the garden that also can support my sister. But it's going to be sorting out the fi uh, finances and working out how to do it because the reason the loft is out is we had that locked into and it was about £60,000 and we're all going, mm, oh. My sister's a senior lecturer. She doesn't make enough to do that. My mum's on pensions no and i'm a contract lecturer so <laughs> not a chance in <laughs> oh hello greg right there's some sharing butter do you have a license for that i'm fairly sure it was probably wiped down drops off and picked up at a socially distance uh, distancing as for the you know and the, the whole thing is if i have a proper office space then i don't keep having to move everything around because half the trouble is my this is my bedroom as well as my office and all the books and everything and it's got a huge bed in it which makes it a very very cramped office or it has a whole lot of desk in it which makes it a very very cramped bedroom and it's these two objects, they both take up quite a lot of space. And then there's the boxes of books and yeah, office. And of course, if I get such a cabin, then I'll have to do some very nice, um, very nice um, shelving, which will be made of, uh, I will probably make myself of marine plywood. Because, you know, 18 mil marine plywood, that's going to last for freaking ever look after my books nicely and be also a great service which i can build a model railway on not that i'm considering all these things and sort of add some foam on top and you can have the trains running around hi tis francis fault hello i haven't seen you in a while how are you doing garrison 60 must have been a big serious big house no really not Really not, just an incredibly awkward roof. Basically, everything that could be problematic and make it a problem is the case. My sister did the survey herself, and we got an, another surveyor in to check, and it basically was going to require four steels, and they would have had to be put in a position, all sorts of things. So, yeah, they, the attic conversion was out because of the roof shape. And we just had the roof done. Right then. Ooh. Right. Mainly because I can hear my um, sister and my neighbour now having a nice long conversation because they haven't managed to get together and chat in ages. All right, Townsend's but look at him. Ooh, send a link. Uh, post a link somewhere. I'll have a look at it.
I know, Jay. I know you know what you're talking about, but I also know how my sister does as well. And that roof is not easy. Um, basically, our roof was the flower of 1970s beautiful construction. It's um, it's fun. <laughs> oh, hey. Right, so let's start off with some of today's books, some of the more interesting ones. Um, right. One of the most interesting architects that we don't associate with naval diplomacy, and probably one of the most contentious people I'm going to discuss today, is this lady. Margaret Thatcher, statecraft. Now, here's the thing. I will say this now up to the point. Every single woman in my life that is boring about, uh, well, it, that, let's put it this way. If I go through my cousins, my mother, my sister, my girlfriend, most of my friendship group, actually, Margaret Thatcher is an absolute hero for them as well. Either they think because she was the first female Prime Minister, so she did a good job there. Others like her because of some of the other successes. They don't think she's universally amazing. She made mistakes, and she's got good points and bad points. But they think she's really quite inspiring. And I have to say, that to an extent probably covers... Um... <sighs> Quite a you know, quite a lot of people in this world. With Margaret Thatcher, she learns her lesson early on, in to an extent in her career, with the Falklands War. Because she tries to do things with just regular diplomacy, uh, just talking to people, it doesn't work. And she tries doing the diplomacy where, because you are a strong ally in one part of the world, your allies will look after you in another part of the world. Both fail her. Both fail her completely. And she becomes a great big advocate after that for presence and for having your own capabilities. I wouldn't say she always makes the right choices, but... This is a very interesting book to read from the perspective of someone who was in that position when the world was changing and dealing with all the differences of the war of the world and all the conflicts going on. She does have It's interesting to note the tables she has in here. NATO defense expenditure, free countries, government spending on unemployment, international labor costs, overseas investment, trade blocks Freedom, prosperity, uh, pro uh, prosperity, and fertility rates. That's what she's discussing. She has all sorts of maps in here. It's an... It's an interesting approach by probably what was a unique elder states person by the time she's writing this. Strap, Doctor. How many major naval bases should a nation have? It crossed my mind. If you keep all your ships in a limited number of ports, it provides a single point of failure. Yeah, this is why I'm very, very antsy whenever people say, oh, we should close down Portsmouth, Plymouth, or... Oh, it's a Scottish one. And um, no. It's like I'm not keen on us all having all the submarines based in one base. But then we're again, we don't have enough submarines really to justify basing them in two. I'm not keen on us dividing our fleet up with carriers on one base, etc. We need to have other ports which can take the carriers and service them. Frankly, if I was the government, I would be paying a lot of money to have. Liverpool, Southampton, and probably a couple of other of the cruise ferry terminal, uh, uh, the cruise ship terminals, 
upgraded. Because that would seem to me to be the obvious backup solution. To have cruise ship terminals, which have to be for quite big ships anyway, upgraded a few. There's not many more facilities, really, that they need that can't be improvised on a... If there's enough... If the right infrastructure is put in place that can't be improvised quite quickly to support the Queen Elizabeth class versus a cruise ship. Especially if you design it so that, I don't know... Um, great big coaches can get down onto the quayside straight next to the cruise ship, well then, so can quite a large number of lorries. Strub, Doctor, how do you imagine... Uh, so, I'll answer that. Stephanie Wilson, Doctor Clark, uh, I have PM'd you the link on Discord. Downtown's had the advantage of their own wood. Cool. I think... Um, what we're probably going to go with is a Dunster log cabin. Is it Dunster? No, it might not be Dunster. Lagarde. Lagarde. Um, log cabin. And I. the debate is whether or not I'm going to build it or whether we're going to get professionals in to build it. And then I'm just going to do the fitting out. I think I might well go for the professionals building it because then there's a guarantee supplied with it and it doesn't cost that much more. And they will have built more than uh, more before. So they will know better than what they're doing. Whereas this will be the first time I'd be building it. So I will probably try and help out and watch while it's being built and then do the fitting out, which will be the internal carpentry, which, thanks to my granddad and dad, I'm fairly good at. And my mum as well, to be fair. Hi, Nat Heron Production. Jerison, Margaret Fletcher also at the forefront of legalizing homosexuality. Meanwhile, Che Guevara tortured them and put them in prison. Fletcher seen as evil while Che was considered... Yeah, there are... Look. Let's be honest. It, one of the interesting things that have been going on today, and I've been trying to get into the Singtel discussion to extent with Daniel and Daniel, Daniel, we've been getting into with that, um, has been the issues that come up with perception versus reality. The perception of most of the people when they're reading back history is the focus of Britain was always on Europe, and World War II was always going to start in Britain in World War in Europe. It could very easily have started in the Far East. It was certainly not much of a... It was divided attention, arguably, Britain had. They were both watching Europe and watching the Far East and equally going... Uh, like that. And it's the same with some of the men, uh, some of the history we have in terms of the group memory and perception of people versus the reality. There are some people who are just bad. Hitler. Just bad. I'm sorry. There is nothing he could have done which could outweigh what he did. But there are other people who are far more complicated. And I worry with a lot of the political debate and a lot of the modern diplomatic debate that we don't have that discussion anymore. We don't have room for the nuance. But Margaret Thatcher's statecraft if you are prepared to read it with a sort of open, critical mind that's going to look at it and go, are you polishing your own halo here? Or have you got some interesting stuff? To, uh, or is this a good uh, sort of good point? There's a little bit of halo polishing, a little bit of legacy building, but overall not much. And it cost me £17. And it's Margaret Thatcher. And it's quite... Let's be honest. How many... Female leaders of international countries have there been who have been, had to deal with as many wars as she's had to deal with. So not only has she been a female leader of a one of the most powerful democracies in the world, arguably, but she's also gone to war and managed them going to war. There aren't many others who have that have had that role, and there is. As I was trying to sort of explain with Queen, when we're talking about Queen Elizabeth the Amada, you, there is sort of different perceptions of female leaders when they go to war. There's the whole reason that Elizabeth I makes this speech where she has says she has the stomach and the stomach of a king of England at that, da 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 da, da stomach of a man, and a king and the king of England at that sort of thing. This sort of speech is she's making that because 
there are she is having to say i am i can still do the fighting i will do the fighting i will do the you know the, well i've got the stomach for war and that's if you look into the falklands war part of the perceptions in the argentinian leadership or the uh, certainly part of the perceptions i would think is down to their perception of a female leader which was probably stupid, because Margaret Thatcher was probably tougher than most of the blokes who come before <sighs> Baz Lane, thank you for reminding me of the Navy base. Uh, I've just gone. I kept wanting to say Resife, but knew it wasn't Resife. So from uh, Sean Mac, something, something, Pearl Harbor, and that was only roughly half the US then. Yeah. It's trying to talk. Labour legalised it in 67. Yeah. In fact, the UK's been fairly progressive the whole way through when it's come to these things. Jerison. Hi, Ben and Nora. If anyone wasn't, you're wise to go with experience firm. That was my theory as well. Although it costs more. Jeff Beeler, Singtel, always remember logistics, asked Michael. <laughs> yeah, um, I have an idea actually for that. Um, I'm looking into it, but I'm sort of, I'm thinking of doing a, 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 trying to do some sort of specialist version of sort of, a, a seeing if I can't organize a YouTube event for, um, Uh, Taranto because it's the 80th anniversary this year it's the 80th anniversary of the Royal Navy taking out the ja the Italian Navy as a diversion because that's what Taranto was it was a diversion and I have some plans and hopefully Hopefully, I have uh, everything set up and office set up for then because I might see if I can get Drac involved and J Jamie from Armored Carriers and maybe even Michael Clapp. Although that'd be more difficult, but maybe I could do that. Hmm. William Cox, that's a good point. War is a logistics punctuated by brief points series of terror. Peacetime is logistics punctuated by brief points of tension. Jerison, Troubles, Northern Ireland. Uh, what else did Thatcher deal with? Um, she dealt with the Falkland Islands, First Gulf War, and... Uh, the Soviet Union. I do agree with when it comes to Indira Gandhi and Golda Meir, William Cox, but um, unfortunately, Gandhi didn't manage to write anything, and Golda Meir's book, uh, the well, the book I at last read, which I think was written by her, frankly, wasn't really that easy going, even for me. Strub, Mayport, FL is Mayport, Florida is a large port. She okay? There's only one large vessel, the two IOG, the IOG LHD. If some US states want all the vessels in their state, yes, the QE can fit. Hmm, cool. Adam Crow, hi Adam. She supported Mujahideen too. Uh, yes, but interesting enough, she was another one who, along with, oh, what's her name, Charlie Cox, a senator in the United States, who was very keen on having education and funding going after they kicked the Soviets out. The trouble was, everyone was prepared to provide money when they were fighting the Soviets, but no one was prepared to mine, provide money after the, the Soviets had been kicked out, which is what how, re the reason what happened to Afghanistan happened to Afghanistan. 
because everyone's prepared to pour money in there for fighting, but no one for reconstruction afterwards. And that would mean sensible. Because believe it or not, most of the Mujahideen were not Al-Qaeda. Most of the Mujahideen were people like the Northern Alliance, who are, yeah, I wouldn't say are the most um, religiously tolerant in the world, probably, but um, they are a very, very different mix to the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Neil yeah, Waddle, have enjoyed the Sinha and Tsingtao vids. However, I think you might have underestimated the power of the 1940 presidential election and the power of the isolation, uh, isolationist movement. I could see Roosevelt trying to take the page from his cousin and trying to be the peace broker. Um, you see, the thing is, I could see him potentially trying that, but... I don't think either side would be paying attention. I think also... The trouble is America isn't powerful enough at that time to force the heads together. This is the point. In 1939, no one either three big naval powers can have a naval war and no one is powerful enough to stop any two of them having a fight. The third one's basic job is going to be either sit here watching them bash each other apart and possibly deal the victor or... I enter and make sure I decide who the vector is going to be. William Cox. Ah. Rapid Razorback. Singtown needs a movie or a book. It does need something. I'm planning on doing a book about it once I've managed to do the research. Hopefully, in, uh, if I can get the place in Oxford, the visiting fellowship, which is when they give you accommodation and access to the Bodleian, um, that should help me. So the application all goes in this week, so that should help. The cross fingers for that one. New IKB 4472. Royal Navy plans diversions within distractions and within divisions. Yep. Everyone complains about the paper bushes, but their brains are melting trying to do it themselves. Probably. Rapid Razor, it was Charlie Wilson. It was, wasn't it? I said Charlie Cox, didn't I? Sorry. Jeff Beamer, Gulf War one, uh, 1 was Thatcher's final achievement. Her mind was failing her and she had to be replaced quickly by the competent John Major. I'm not sure we're ever going to call John Major competent. I don't... Yeah. Jerishan, Northern Alliance veterans went on to form the core base of the ANA commanders. Those guys are... Yeah. They are interesting, they're not of an alliance. Are there any good moments on books on ballsy diplomacy and naval diplomacy? Not yet. I have a tent a tent My idea is to do get the tribal battles and earnings book out. Then get a book based on my PhD out after doing an edited book with my girlfriend the Falklands War. Uh, then do a autobiography of Admiral Henderson. And then, after probably publishing a whole series of articles and doing lots of talks about it, actually do a book on naval diplomacy. But until then, the best option you've got, if I can spot it in my bookshelves, is Gundot Diplomacy by James Cable, which I have talked about before, but I didn't get out today because I've talked about it so much before. I didn't think you'd all want to be bored with it again. Or rather, hear me talking about it again. No, no. No. Ah, there it is, right behind my head. 1919 to 1979. James Cable's Gunboat Diplomacy. That's if you're looking for that. Mm -hmm. Right then, so.
Jeff here, the Taranto presentation reminds me of a discussion of the old Europol War game mailing list, trying to figure out what units were actually available and could they be supplied and how mobile are. Yeah. Sure, Mike. As Rudolf was totally willing to manufacture a justification. Yeah, I think he honestly would have been going. I think my honest suspicion is that Roosevelt would have found the reason to join the Allies. Um, and I think he would have realized... It, it, it's going to sound strange. While there's peace, it's very easy to be an isolationist for peace. When there's a war going on in Japan with Japan between Britain and these things, and you've got Britain and European powers beating up on Japan... And it looks like it's going to be a quick war, quickly over, and Britain's going to win. Um, hmm. And the reason is Britain probably would win is because so much of the Japanese Navy that we know from World War II is either not available or doesn't exist at that time. It's just not there. Strub, how many different books do you have plans for? Um, I have planned out 10 books. Possibly 11. I have a whole list of what I would like to do, book-wise. It's going to take me a while to get through them. This is why I need office space. That's my line, and I'm sticking to it. Not because I'm completely antisocial and don't like being surrounded by people. And there's not enough space in this room for my both my bed and my desk. Jeff Miller, pleasurable biography of Michael Clapp or maybe call, a call for an autobiography of him. That would be tempting, sir, definitely. Sure, Mac. Golden Eagle, going to have to disagree with you there because it strikes me as there was so much better X number of years ago feeling. Hmm. Winston Churchill was a mediocre peacetime PM and he floated between the cons and liberals. I agree. Um, it's Some people are good at wartime. It's some people are good under pressure. Some people are good in certain circumstances because of their particular traits that makes them terrible in other leadership leaders in other searching circumstances, which is why I hate when people go, oh, I've got to start learning to be more like this person or that person for my leadership. And I go, no, because are they completely different personality traits from you? Because then you're going to always look fake when you're being a leader. Just be you. Golden Eagle, um, I'm sorry to say, your point of post-war, I feel Churchill just wanted to start trouble in Russia and US to, for Britain to stay relevant. Um, I'm, there was enough trouble already going on between Russia and uh, America. Uh, the trouble was Roosevelt was de uh, dead and Churchill wasn't around at the end of the war. And the leaders who took over after Roosevelt were not as familiar with the dynamic with Stalin. Stalin didn't respect them as much. So that caused a lot of problems because Stalin respected Roosevelt. He respected Churchill. He had some very nuts. He had us almost respect for Attlee, but he wasn't as respectful of him. And he had absolutely no respect for Truman. He considered Truman to be Roosevelt's lackey and shouldn't ever have been allowed anywhere near power. John, good evening, Dust Clark. I like the heraldry. Yes, it was designed for me by Draken for now. <laughs> oh. Hmm. William Cox, look at the photos of the Cairo conference. Three great leaders were flogged to the gills, but all leaders were forced to apply to stim stimulants to keep them awake for weeks at a time. Oh, yeah. Darling, not just Stalin versus Truman, the military industrial complex also walked over Truman. I think the military industrial complex is blown up by people who want to talk about it. 
honestly, having been in meetings with those companies represented, which are supposed to be this uh, uh, almighty complex, which are going to control the world, um, I have never met a more petty, disagree uh, disagreeing with each other group than I know to mankind. In some kinds, as times, even in conferences, I have found myself playing the role of umpire and peacemaker between representatives of different um, companies which are supposed to be supplying arms. In the nicest way, the military industrial complex, if it could actually. could, probably. It's got all the equipment, the capabilities it could probably get out, if it would actually work together. But seeing as they distrust and hate each other far more than they do anyone else. Anyone else? Basically, imagine the Imperial Japanese Army and Imperial Japanese Navy, and then times that by about bazillion, and that is what you have the average feeling of any employee of one of those companies versus an employee of another co another of the companies. It just ain't gonna work. Um, but guy, what classes would you pick to make up a navy in World War II if you could only pick one class per type of warship, like Fletchers for destroyers? Oh, it'll be tribals for destroyers, but this is me. Um, or maybe battles. Ooh, battles. Then I'd have the 4.5 inch guns, the 40 millimeters, which would be good for AA. I'd have all those torpedoes. Technically, the daring start in World War II, but. I, I I am honest enough to be in. So if I was going to pick one destroyer from World War Two, I'd probably pick the battles because they're pretty much the best destroyers which come out of World War Two, and they just managed to serve. HMS Barfleur does get involved at the end of World War Two. Um, light cruisers, you know, I'm going to pick the town class. They are lovely. Um. Heavy cruisers, I'm probably... Ooh, I'm, I'm torn between the Italians and the Americans on that one. Carriers, um, I'm going to go for the Malta class. The ones which weren't built. Battleships, I'm going to go for the hours because the lines weren't built. And frankly, it doesn't seem fair to keep going for unbuilt ships. But, you know. Um... I like my T-Class subs too much. I want my T-Class. I'm going to have them, them for my heavy subs. For my tiny subs, I'm going to have used. And for my intermediates, I'm going to have... Probably one of the American designs. Rather than the S-Class. It's an interesting time. Uh, aircraft are even more fun. I'd, I'd be the guy going for Hellcats rather than Corsairs. John Luke, I've always thought a fully deployed battle group to be most effective neighbor negotiator. It is. And let's go on to the next book. Okay, here is a book I doubt any of you will have ever heard of before. In fact, if you have, I'll be incredibly impressed. A Diplomat Off Duty by Sir Francis Lindley. Produced by Belleville Library, and it is published in... First published in 1928, this edition published in 1947. And it basically covers all the stuff a diplomat does off duty in order to stay connected as a diplomat with the local people, how he gets involved. And he also says how he to wind up. He takes up fishing, and there's the picture of him fishing on the sort of thing. He takes up fishing because in one posting he was being followed everywhere around by the intelligence officers, so he thought he'd make their lives a living nightmare by going fishing. Because 
If you go fishing, you go off on your own to the middle of nowhere and are standing in a river. And it's an excellent position, which you could be a spy picking up a drop, picking up a, um, a, a, a drop communication system or a dead, uh, you know, all sorts of different systems can be going forward. And it's perfect. So, you know, it's the fun thing. It's, it's a really cool book. And if you give an example. So where is it? Mount Demanid? Some experiences in Bulgaria. Bathing, the taking of ducks, ski running in Norway, tiger hunting in Korea, birds of passion, shooting in the spring, birds in Hampshire Garden, salmon, salmon fishing, Philistine fishermen, fish hosts and fishing guests, and dry fly fishing in Winchester. So basically, if you love hearing about diplomacy and fishing, this is it. But it's it's also a bit of... Um, you've probably... Uh, heard quite a lot about re the various railway guides that are produced over the years of guides of places to go, what to see, all these things. This is kind of like it. It's a diplomat's guide to this is where I've been. This is what I was seeing. This is who I met. It really is very cool. Mm. And it's. Let's see. This book, the book was intended for an address book, and the pages were cut in letters so that each name could be found at once under its appropriate letter of the alphabet. A schoolboy of 15 has no urgent need for an address book for his friends, and looking back, I cannot but think that I must have possessed an unusual feeling of fitness of things to have chosen such a book for setting forth the doings of the birds which were then my passion. Uh, it... <sighs> See, I read his documents in National Archives. Because he does get around, and he does so many interesting things, and this is a really cool memoir. It's one of those things you don't get often as a historian. You get their official professional lives, and you get none of their personal writings. Or you get a very tailored autobiography, which is entirely very official and all this thing. And this is actually entirely... I'm cutting out all the official business I've done. If you want to read the official business... You can see the court documents and these things and all those things. That That's fine. This is all the stuff I do when I'm not on duty, when I'm wandering around. And it's it's cool. I knew that question would start off a lot of discussions. The earlier one about the what ships and my perfect fleet. Jefferson, the arms com companies do exist and even buy parts from another. Almost all military data comics are done by General Annex. Challenge 2 is a hot mess of like seven different major defense characters. Um, I'd say it's a hot mess of about 12, but yeah, we'll go with seven. Grand President, Norman Freeman seems to have major beef with the hours. Well... I can understand it, and honestly, I would prefer to go Lions or 15-inch King George V's, but yeah. Shrub, Doctor, why do you like Hellcats over Corsairs? Well, if I take this little beauty down for a second. Right. So... A Hellcat is supremely a bal well balanced aircraft. It's got a pugnacious little engine. It flies along at this sort of angle. So that's what it looks like in flight. Although its wheels will be up. It's very tough. It's surprisingly agile for its shape and size. And it's incredibly reliable and easy to maintain. And also, if you're landing it, you don't have to do fancy crab landing. So you don't have to do as you're coming in and then plop it down. Or a steep. And hope you hit the deck. You can do a far more 
like that. And that is far better in my opinion. Plus, I've got the at Duxford, they allowed me to stand between, uh, stand, not only stand beside them, but stand between a, a Hellcat and a Wildcat. And that will make me a very, very happy gentleman. <sighs> very, very happy. Mm-hmm. New IKB4472. Diplomats are never off duty. I would agree. They aren't. They are rarely, rarely ever off duty. But this one is... Uh, there's a... <sighs> My trip is in here. Actually, they made it in here. But I did find it. Thanks for this one. Um, there's a story of him being followed all around <laughs> Bulgaria <laughs> by <laughs> four agents. And they ended up having a team of, I think, 16 in the end following him because he's going to all these out-of-the-way fishing spots. And they keep thinking he's going to be picking up dead drops. And he then gets back and you're having a chat with the guy who his strong suspicion is the actual intelligence officer on the embassy. And... Um, the guy basically says, you're making my life very, you're making my life and my duties very, very easy. Uh, would you like some money for your trips? Oh, yes, please. And so when he goes next trips, instead of having to sleep in his car, he gets to sleep in hotels because they're paying for him because it's winding up the uh, for intelligence, uh, local intelligence officers that much. I know. It's fun. William Cox, I was designed to, uh, to too many conflicting crimes and so became racehorses designed by committee. With that said, I love them. That's my point. I actually... Uh, uh, you see, for me, Vanguard is too much of a we have these components, so let's build something. We need to build something. She's kind of like I feel Hood is almost and Nelson and Rodney. We need to build something with World War One experience, so we will build this. We need to build something World War Two experience, so we will build this. I'm not actually that big a fan of her. I think she's a bit of a step back, honestly, in some respects, especially in her number and our, uh, number of armament and her size and all some of certain things. But you know. Mm. John Luke, 17,000 tons Balamore is seven tribals. I would say it's more like nearly approaching... It's over eight. Tribals, well, seven possibly can... It's about average 2,200 tons. Yeah, you're possibly... It's, it's between seven and eight. Seven and a half, probably. Reparation, military attaches to spies a diplomatic cover. Any books? Oh, I have some more books coming, which will be quite fun for you guys to look, uh, look, hear about. Uh, the Japanese. I have that book somewhere, but I can't find it. I think it's in one of my boxes. Um, I think it's in one of the boxes in the uh, boxes in the, um, the uh, William Cox first point. The Japanese agent who photographed Pearl Harbor has a book. He was assigned as an attaché. He was. And I have that book, but I think it's in one of the boxes up in the attic. Michelle, my sister made the recent discovery that our diesel tractor does not run when the fuel filter is full of water. There is no... <laughs> oh... Well, uh, I would say my sister's the engineer, I'm the historian, and 
I still wind her up about the time she said that she thought her car sounded sporty, and I said, I'm sure it does. The exhaust is cracked. Um, it was a me it was a Metro 100. At no point should a Metro 100 sound sporty. <sighs> John Luke, the MIC is a big letdown, to be honest. We should be getting more toys and gadgets than we do. Budget cuts um, undermine the military-industrial complex theory anyway. So does Diffid. So many things on the, on the uh, undermine the military-industrial complex. Um, honestly, if you're looking at the UK, you could argue we have a medical-industrial complex, but not a military-industrial complex. And even that, I would strongly disagree with the analysis of, because again, most of the medical companies I know, and most of the parts of the NHS are again fairly much at open war with each other. I have huge support for them. I just from my meetings with them know they get very, very um for want of a better word, tribal. Jerison, heresy, Vanguard is a perfect vessel. Have you seen that hull design? Um, definitely, Doctor. I always wondered why they didn't take the spare sixteens from the O class and have Vanguard with free treble mounts. Ugh. That would have made sense. Also, if we'd gone for a sixteenth, it would have actually made the Vanguard far more viable because we could have shared ammunition supply and development with the Iowas. For the US Navy, so we could probably get a Vanguard going a little bit longer. Might have even had a round for the Falklands War. Activating her could have been fun, but she could have been around for it. And we can all imagine what the Argentinian face would have been like when she hoped into view for some fire support for, for, for the troops ashore. Uh, we would all like to not be on the mountain anywhere now. Uh, you shortly won't be on the mountain, because the mountain will soon be flattened. William Cox, once you remove the must-be-able-to-dogfight requirement, attack and fighter escort lines blur. That they do. John, Dr. Clark, as much as I love Rodney, why didn't the RN cannibalize the guns of Rodney for Vanguard? The old girl was in a tough spot mid-war. Honestly, because Rodney was... The guns were worn out after D-Day. Um, uh, there were lots of 16-inch going around. We'll go for this for next book, because there's a question coming. Any good books on the use of threat of military force as a diplomatic tool? General Wesley K. Clark, Waging Modern War. And actually, I would combine it with... Uh, to End a War by Richard Hollybrook. So these two books. Now... If I go spot it, I'll probably grab Michael Rose's book as well. Fighting for Peace, but I can't see it at the moment. I'll probably find it when this is all over. They're all good books for if you're looking at how military force can be used to try and persuade people to negotiate. But they also point to limitations. At a certain point, you have to do the fighting. And at a certain point, the fighting might not be very effective. Um, Bosnia, Kosovo, both examples of this where, frankly, the air attack wasn't as effective as often it's portrayed. Uh, lots of weapons are dropped, but the enemy doesn't suffer as much as they say it is. And it's, it's one of the interesting things. It's, it, it, it's the lessons of all modern wars we've had is that our weapons are not as effective, are still very incredibly effective, 
but are never as effective as the manufacturers claim they're going to be. And it doesn't matter who has produced the weapons. Do not believe what the manufacturers or your and the government which is buying them says about their effectiveness. Hi, Daniel Freeman. Jerison, Vanguard is fastest battleship. Hull design. Have a look at it. Jerison, JK, a joke. She could have had some triple A and Z turrets. She could have had lots of things. William Cox, Navalist versus anti navis on the War of 1812 makes a quick informed to read. It does. Gone eagle, the slot. Soon there won't be a mountain there any longer. Pretty much, that's the whole point. If you had... And you see, one of the interesting things with the decisions to take Vanguard out of service, it's when you're looking at it, is the cost of supplying and maintaining ammunition. So if you had gone with 16-inch guns, which were the same as the battleships which the Americans were keeping in, and it would have been a unique, a unique capability we could have maintained, which would have been very helpful for parts of the things versus uh, the Soviet cruisers and the Soviet vessels, she would have probably been maintained. And she would have probably been made reserve flagship. But honestly, she'd have been something nice to have and for the Falklands War, very, very useful. Michael Clapp might have used her as his flagship. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I just had a vision of what Michael Clapp would have done with her as his flagship. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, the poor Argentinian. Actually, possibly it's a good thing from the point of view of not having a memory of a battleship charging into the Port Stanley and engaging Argentine positions at point-blank range. It's possibly a good thing they didn't have a battleship. Oh, God. Oh. We'll take one squadron of commandos and one of the battalion of Gurkhas and we will offload them straight into Port Stanley with 16-inch fire support. <laughs> oh, God help all oh, oh, the Argentinians. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, I, I got lost in that one. I, I do admit, I, I went too far. I do, I do apologize. I can imagine BBC cameras taking footage of the bombardment of Goose Green as ship fire is directed by helicopter. Oh, that would be interesting. <laughs> oh. um, Spotty Metro makes me think the guy who got in high speed chase is a smart car. Yeah. Constructors. We might actually have a British 20th century battleship museum, is what you're saying with Vanguard. Yep. But if it had survived long enough, it would have probably been preserved for the Falk especially if it had taken part in the Falklands War. It would have been preserved. Um, because it would have been a beautiful capital asset to preserve somewhere, and it would have been just, you know, kept. Bud Guy 8829. What was the practical size limit for warships in World War II? Not counting Panama Canal size limit, uh, size limit since that didn't stop the construction of the midways. Uh, the sewers, to an extent. But also the limits of your dry dock size and availability and where you have the dry docks. Uh, Jonathan Smith, would a 16-inch Vanguard have fired enough main rounds to have needed a source for replacement rounds? Um, probably not if we'd maintained a sufficient stockpile from World War II, but, you know, it might have done. Might have. Um, Patton, Paul from Chicago, what's your take on West Clark's airport raid versus the Russians? Uh, my take on it is that, thank God for James Blunt, who had Nicholas Jackson 
basically um, screaming in one ear going, do not, whatever you do, engage the Russians. Do not engage the Russians. And where's Clark going, attack, attack, attack. And James Blunt basically went, eh, they're not causing me any trouble. And then does one of the smartest things known to mankind, which is parks his vehicles across all the water supplies for the airport. So very shortly soon, the Russians have to get very, very friendly with them to get any water. Um. <laughs> Then from sadly his guitar survived the comic. Don't be too sad. We also have, you know, yes, we have the songs, including You're Beautiful. But we also have his absolutely exceptional Twitter put downs. And let's be honest, that is a good thing because James Blunt's Twitter put downs of people who are being rude to him are something to memorialize and make you happy on a bad day. Um well, Owen Cox, remember, a warship is an investment feature. You must be able to feed and burp it, change diapers, and uh, as a dry dock space and click channel. Yeah. Uh, Strap, Doctor, with a good spotter aircraft, how accurate was naval gunfire support during World War II? I.e., road crossings or large free field? Uh, definitely road crossings. In fact, they could do that without spotter aircraft if they had forward observers in the right positions. On the ground with radios. And often that was with training, what was definitely was aimed at. Sorry. Getting the books out earlier, I managed to knock my trains off the track. My little trucks have got off the, knocked off the track and um, it's annoying me. Uh, New Akin before 72, the General Belgrano, if the General Belgrano had made it into gunfight with the surface elements of British Task Force, would it have pushed naval development back to lots of guns? It would have certainly had an impact. Would it have been back to lots of guns? I'm not sure. Maybe double guns? Um, Nighthound Productions. What? I have to ask you. What is about that Vanguard's hull design you don't like exactly? I assume it goes beyond the aesthetics. Uh, too short, too narrow. And to be honest, Needs to be a little bit higher. It needs a little bit higher freeboard. And I changed the angle of the bow as well. Give it a slightly higher speed. By Sam Nelson, in terms of how military force can be used, Linnaeus gave one perfect example as the the uh, uh, Ulysses. Diplomats should draw more circles around foreign leaders. That's negotiating a style. Yeah. I prefer to go for an easier victory for my jokes. Deutschland class Panzer Chief. Oh, we can make so many jokes about us. Wonder. If Labour been the carriers in the late sixties, no way Vanguard would have made it to the Falklands. The thing was, they don't they bin the carriers, but they don't bin the carriers in the late sixties. They decide to get rid of them. Okay. They decide not to replace them. They don't decide to get rid of the carriers immediately. And I don't think they would have got rid of Vanguard immediately. They'd have just said, we're not going to replace it. That doesn't mean they're going to get rid of it. If you look at when the actual ships actually go out of service. So actually, they go, by the time some of them actually don't go out of service till pretty much Conservatives are in power. The Conservatives are in power. Um, so the Conservatives could have saved them. William Cox, Conga class light BBs did not have a spotter plane to bomb an airfield at night. It was an amazing feed hour. Hmm. John Luke, if a ship like KGV got close enough to an Iowa, would its armor hold its own against KGV's 14s and vice versa? Honestly, not. If they get close enough. Once you're at point blank range, there is just the big boom.
Then Truman, the other great thing Vanguard brings is all those lovely air guns, yes. And as I said, Michael Clapp could have done with a decent flagship, which would have had space for his staff. She'd have also probably been retrofitted as a helicopter carrier. This is the thing. She'd have probably lost maybe her stern guns, a stern mount for a helicopter hangar and landing things, kind of like what happened to the tight glass cruisers. Remnator. Uh, ooh. John Shane, a lot of big boom, basically the Typhoon class with larger than 200 mm guns. Hmm. Rapid race back. Nail the phone behold the massive ship of your coast. Yeah, why, yes, it's fully loaded. Let's talk. That does tend to work quite well. Jeremy, our genius would be just the most obvious there. He's supposed to. Man, God help the Falklanders and their windows if there had been 16 inch guns. Uh, they wouldn't have had windows left. It would have been terrible, but there again, the other teams might not have, would, would never have dreamed to come back. Jeff Beeler, Matrix, Matrix Vanguard. Michael Clapp could have brought his Western Wasp and maybe more helicopters in general. Would she be handy enough to use Falkland Sound and could she hit Port Stanley from there? Uh, possibly could use Falkland Sound. I think certainly can make a pass on it. And um, probably. I think she could have possibly made it into San Carlos Bay, actually. Um, Daniel Freeman, I can I see Commodore Clapp aboard HS Vanguard as his flagship charging them to Port Stanley going, it was good enough for the battle cruise in 1914, it's good enough for me. Yeah, uh, to be honest, I would probably, if I'd been the Argentinians and seen that coming into me, I'd, I'd have probably decided I wanted to be elsewhere. William Cox, dry dock need was why Atreus Countime made her epic, uh, epic suicide run. That is true. And guess what I have? C. Lucas Phillips, the greatest raid of all. St. Nazaire. Sitting as one of the books here. And it's, um, I've been reading it today, actually, for some reason. And it's a pretty cool trip. And that's what they do. That's quite a long journey. Now, have you guessed something? Yes, I have a light now up there. A new one. It's supposed to make things better. That's, I think, helped the sitting, helped the light. It's a good book, this one. Um, it's got lots of different pictures and lots of different documents, uh, uh, references in here. I really quite like this. It's um, published... First published in 1958. This edition is published in 2000 by Pan Books, and it is by C. Lucas Phillips. It's well worth reading if you're interested in the Santa Zare Red, the greatest red of all. Trent Lanka, General Clark and Gosso War is a classic bad American stereotype. Yeah, you can say that again. Generation, my old man was K4, was with K4, and some lands Land Rover got rammed by a BTR. Ooh, what happened to the poor BTR? That would have probably broken in half. Yes, it's more solid than a Humvee, but it's probably less solid than a Land Rover. Jerishan, HS Vanguard, too short. Do you mean not long enough? I mean, she was far more stable than other battleships were designed to be at the time, and all these things. But actually, if she had, it was shown by a study which was done at the time she was building, that if she had been four meters longer, 50 centimeters wider, roughly, we're talking about, um, it was. We're talking in feet, uh, so actually it was to be 14 feet longer, what, about a foot what, a foot and a half wider, a sort of a foot and a half greater beam. She would have been 
capable of two knots higher speed and would have had a, her cruising range increased by a thousand nautical miles for the same amount of bunker fuel. Plus, she'd have been far more stable when firing her guns. Well, she'd have been far more on the predictable lips yeah, movement for, saying, for firing her guns. Can I think there were videos of some politician running over a car one of years ago? Hmm. But no, well, you say not to go, not too good rid of, get rid of them immediately, but they do with HMS Victorious. They do with Victorious, but they keep Ark Royal around for quite a while, and they and Hermes is around to be converted into a commando carrier, and all sorts of things happen. So it's not a comp, it's not a straight up scenario. And Vanguard would have been safe for a bit, a little bit longer. Plus, it's something that's sort of interesting. Um, they're getting rid of the carriers because they didn't need to. Fo they didn't need to focus on the big Atlantic, but they did think they needed to focus on the northern flank on Norway. And actually, if Vanguard had been around there, Vanguard would have been an incredibly important part of Norway operations because of the need to have artillery support for those operations and her guns providing a lot of support, especially if she had sixteen-inch ones. So, um, I think there would have been a good case of keeping her. Dr. Thompson, did the clock, I thought I used a good foundation of BCG. Did my changes help or hinder the efficiencies in baseline? They helped quite a bit. It's a good design you've got there. Uh, ben, Laura, I will admit I have a little good, a little good to say about Wilson, Heath, and Callahan. Aside from sending British troops into Vietnam, aside, well, they, yeah, Manhattan production, Jerison. I would also imagine lightning her would be a drawback for turning. Her turning circle wasn't much better than the hoods. No respect to Doctor Clark's opinion. Um, I also mentioned lengthening her would not be uh, would be a drawback. I agree on her turning circle, but actually, part of her her turning circle was actually a lot better than hoods. Because she was dense in the hood. Remember, she's built as a battleship. Hood is built with some um, uh, some parts as a battleship, but she's actually not as dense as a battleship would be to try and save weight. So Vanguard is a far denser. For the same size, Dan Vanguard is far denser. If she had been armed with three treble 16-inch guns, that would have probably made her denser still. Give her the extra length and the beam, and you would have a ship which would actually turn, uh, which would turn better than she did, and she did turn better than the hood. Jeff, they looked at a helicopter carrying in the Iowas, and the problem was for trim reasons. You cannot remove the rear gun turrets. Not a great candidate for conversion. Um, you see, the thing with the Iowas was they decided they had enough aircraft in aircraft carriers that it wasn't worthwhile doing it. Because to do the conversion, you would have had to add basically concrete into the ship to maintain the trim. For the Royal Navy, when it did do the conversion to its Tiger class cruisers, etc., guess what they did? So, you know, they added weight to, to support the trim. So I have a feeling that's what they would have done. John Luke, what was World War II USN night fighting on the capability? Battleships night action between KGV or QS? Versus North Carolina, oh, uh, um, in 1940, 1939, 1940, I would put it to QE versus anyone, pretty much. Um, probably would still give it to the Queen Elizabeth class into 1942-ish. Uh, 1943 onwards, it's going to depend who managed to get the first hit. 
because they're all good. Jeff Beaver, clap is too sensible to charge into anywhere. Give him a battleship. We'll see what he does. This is, remember, this is the gentleman who very sensibly armed his ship with every single machine gun going and did patrols in the Indonesian confrontation. Um, uh, and uh, and did go very very close to the um, enemy positions at that point. So I have the feeling he would have possibly not charged straight into Port Stanley. Yeah, I think possibly that one is me going a little bit too far fetched. But I wouldn't be surprised if they found him sitting off Port Stanley, going, "Hello, hello, hello." And especially during the final stages, when the troops you'd land the troops far away, but when the troops came up. Uh, they would arrive. Uh, the troops would arrive on the mountains around Port Stanley, and HMS Vanguard would have hoved into view with a flag with the Commodore aboard and flag flying, going, General Mendez, you have an option. You can fight, but as you see, you are surrounded on all sides. On one side, by particularly massive guns. Or you could not. Also, to be honest, if HMS Vanguard had been there, I doubt the airport airport would have been still been working. They would have probably blasted that away after about one night or so night. Night <sighs> Protection. Though what that with that said, what are your thoughts soon? Uh, uh... Thoughts on the ship made as Vanguard's successor in World of War, sort of, World of War uh, ships, the Conqueror class. Kind of addresses your critiques of the Vanguard in the design. They do. But I haven't really looked at them enough because I haven't played World of Warships yet. But I think I'm going to have to so I can start understanding what people tell you about it. Greg Sussie, Sintness Air is another excellent Clarkson documentary. I have to admit, that's my current. I have got. Uh... It's going to sound strange. Once I finished my PhD, I found myself at a loss because my whole thing had been about getting my PhD and being able to show to people who'd said because of my dyslexia and all these things, I could never do it. So I had to get myself some new goals. Um, first goal was to get three books published. They're not going to be published in the order I wanted them to be published. But to get those three books published. So hopefully one's on its way. The other two are in different stages of the process. Those are the first three books on my list. Troubles, Badders and Darings was originally going to be book number two. My carrier book was going to be book, based on my PhD thesis, was going to be book number one. And Admiral Henderson was going to be book number three. Um, as it is, those are the first two are going to slip round, hopefully. My second thing was to organize an academic conference, which I did with my girlfriend. It was an excellent one on Falcons 4. My third thing, target, and this is probably the most strange one, was to one day work on a documentary with Jeremy Clarkson, because he's done everything I've ever heard about the documentaries he has done, and when he's had his journals on them, is he's been absolutely fantastic. He's been really nice to the historians, really interested in what they do, really worked well with them, made sure they got the credit they deserved and supported in other ways. Um, there is one historian colleague I know who he basically decided, uh, you know, the, when the guy was getting married, he turned up to the wedding and he did all sorts of, he, when he was presenting at a very, very big conference and was worried about it. This was not long after filming. Jeremy Clarkson bought a ticket and turned up at the, at the history conference to support his friend he'd made during the film. So he's a very, very nice man. And um, I suppose now I have to have some ambitions for YouTube as well, don't I? So, uh, well, I'm going to fix my targets. So I'm going to do some short-term targets, long-term. Long-term targets, who knows where it's going to go. But short-term targets... I think my aim is to try and get to the point to which I would consider it a serious YouTube channel. So I'd say, uh, well, Drax on that. So probably about 15,000 subscribers is the target for the YouTube channel. God knows when I'll get there, but that's the target.
<laughs> William Cox, night fighting of US battleships was shown against IJN battleships, um, light battleships. There was a conclusion, though, well clouded with contrary, that radar directed gunfire trumps emphasis on night fighting. It does when radar directed gunfire becomes practical, which is why, as I said, in the early part, up to about the end of 1942, I'd give it to the British uh, British ships because they are, have been are well practiced and have been doing it in war themselves quite a lot. Um, there is Matapan. There are all sorts of actions which are night, and of course, there's the Battle of North Cape, which is also at night. And basically, Scharnhorst doesn't realise anything is there until HMS Duke of York gets really, really, really close and goes, "Hello." Um, with everything, and just going, boom, you may now cease to exist. Uh, I, I have got everything aimed for you here. Um, I've got a good book on that, which is just sitting there by Angus Conson. Um, and so that sort of, the thing is, I, the British are fairly good at night fighting, which is uh, even pre-radar, but when radar comes in, as I said, it depends who gets the first shot. If the Iowa's got the first shot in, then the Queen Elizabeth will be going down. If the Queen's got the first shot in, if H let's say HMS Warspite versus H USS Iowa, and HMS Warspite gets the first shot, that's one. Joe Richardson. Um, I, I reckon I can predict who one of the list likes is. Uh, World War... Oh. Warlord Titan Tiberius, Dr. Clark, what do you think of Japanese reaction uh, was when uh, when off Guadalcanal, the Washington appeared out of night at point blank range with guns at the ready? They probably didn't have much of a reaction. They probably didn't have time for much reaction. It just goes boom. That's the point. It goes boom. And that is the thing. When you're fighting at night and one person has radar and the other one doesn't, it's in the world of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Doesn't matter really how good the radar is, as long as it's good enough. Jeff Bieler, Vanguard was a victim of the missile rules, everything, along with TSR2 and any other uh, fighter of an air fight lightning. Hmm, probably. Sam Thompson, didn't, Dr. Clark, didn't mean to sidetrack into Vanguard so badly. Ah, I enjoy Vanguard as a good discussion. And it has factors in naval diplomacy, because again, a battleship in your force gives you something else you can do. And this is the point that they find... The Indonesian confrontation is a great example of this for naval diplomacy. They are worried about sending an aircraft carrier through a channel. It's your great status unit, but sending the aircraft carrier through is... An aircraft carrier is not something which is designed for close quarters fighting. I know the Royal Navy armoured carriers especially do not understand that this concept applies to them, but aircraft carriers are not technically there for close quarters fighting. This is why you have battle this is why battleships are actually arguably, in certain circumstances, the better naval diplomacy tool. And why there is a good case for having a cruiser like vessel. A vessel with modern levels of armor, so she can take it if she's hit, but so you can send into places which are high risk to go, we can go here. Uh, right. Jeff Healer. If I save a ship for the Falcons of War, it'll be HMS Eagle. I, uh, and she has to say, if I'm only allowed to save one ship, it will be Eagle and it or Ark Royal. Even one will do, as long as they come along with gannets for anti air for airborne early warning. That's all I want. Some freaking AEW. Seriously, airborne early warning. I'll even carry carry on the Sea Harriers. Don't need Phantoms. Don't need Buccaneers. Would love to have them, but if I don't can't have them, that's fine. If I can have gannets then that can make the whole war a far easier war. But if I get a second ship, that would be Vanguard. One of the fleet carriers, so I can have Gannets and Vanguard. Make a very different, big difference to the Falcons War. Strub, Doctor, during the Cold War, what was NATO planning to deal with bears armed with cruise missiles on Northern Run? I always thought you might get a second PQ-17. 
basically, the Nansa to Bears with cruise missiles was F-15s based out of Iceland and F-14 Tomcats with Phoenix missiles. And hopefully the carrier battle groups would distract them long enough to fight them on off them. Right, Not David the phone suit, but when the Americans were getting kicked out of Libya by Gaddafi, the commander of the airbase in Tripoli ordered an F-100, a very loud plane, to fly low-speed laps over the city. Very sensible. J.P. Le Clap is also a planner, hence leaving his wasp behind to bring more staff. Uh, yeah, he left his wasp, uh, his, uh, his wasp behind and handed over to um, so that they would have enough aircraft for everyone else. But actually, uh, he does say afterwards that's the biggest thing he would have regretted because if he'd had his staff helicopter, it would have made life a lot easier to control it or coordinate everything. During the call of prayer, he was told it wasn't politically correct. He asked, what are they going to do? Kick us out? Mm, don't think. Uh, Bud Guy 8829, if you could save only one ship that was scrapped, what ship would you save? I would go with either CB6 Enterprise or USS Pennsylvania. Uh, okay, if Drac was asked this question, I can guarantee you'd probably say HMS War Sprite. I'm going to say HMS. Oh, it's got to be between Eskimo and Nubian, and don't make me pick between my ba uh, pick between the babies. Um. Uh, don't make me pick one of them. They're, they're too good. They're, they're... One sacrificed her bow many, many times in the service of her nation, and the other one just went everywhere and did everything. So, yeah, don't make me pick between them. They're too good. They're, they're too important. Come on. Early in war, it really depends on the commander. If if it's Lee, then uh, if I could be put up there, so, uh, there were some USN commanders that would have turned it into an RN favoured slaughtered. Um, sure, Mac, I'm not sure what you're talking about there. Cox, that's true. We had the D-Do line, which was used to direct fighter insects across uh, towards the Soviet patrol bombs. There was a li lively little war in the sky on the west coast of North America. Yeah. Jeremy, blasting ports down the airport would have been a nice diversion to parallel San Carlos landing and convince Argentinians that Brits would fly try to land near Port Stanley. Oh, it would have. Uh, Mondo, if I could have saved any ship from the yard, it would be QEBB. Uh, would prefer war spite, but was really far, too far gone. And in aust austerity in the UK, to what it would never have happened. That's the point, but if you can save it, then it doesn't matter about money. Warlord Tiber Titan Tiberius, I'd love to have saved the New Orleans CA-32. Cool. Considerance, the joke is that assistant professor applications look like 10-year applications. It has become true. It's been true for a long time. Um, yeah. Jeff Miller, at Sugar Straight Radar got everyone shooting at the same time, same set of gun splashes because it was the biggest radar blob. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. Come on, guys, night fighting. Then there was the period when you had radar, but not enough for fire control, so you knew you were creeping up on someone, but have to light the reflectors or rely on the moon, uh, moon to spot them. Yep. Jeff Miller, try to get Jeremy Clarkson to do a Falklands documentary with the son of the veterans who could make the trip down like Chris Barry. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah. Uh, Stuff Thompson, Dr. Clark, killed an Iowa with a Fiji. Some help from team. In World of Warship Lessons. Vid is on my Discord and YouTube clip. Cool. Productions. I'm in the film industry, and barring that one incident, I've heard nothing but good things about Clarkson. My dad was on a shoot at his house about 20 years ago now, and he came out and offered everyone tea. Yeah. Uh, I know. Um... Daniel Freeman. Iron aircraft carriers took a long time to wash the influence of Jackie Fisher out of the DNA from courageous, furious, ludicrous conversions. Uh, possibly. Well, Tiberius, uh, Titan Tiberius, I'm curious how Willis Ching Lee would have fared at Sema with four to five fast BBs and two or three older BBs. Yeah, 
it would have probably been a little bit easier. Rapid Razorback. Gun-armed heavy cruiser, ideal naval diplomacy tool. Not too big, not too small, can handle itself in a fight. Yeah, pretty much. For modern naval diplomacy, yeah. Jeff Beeler. Vanguard, if they could have found the money to fully commission her and staff, would be more useful than all the surviving Didos for most of the 50s and 60s for diplomatic reasons. Yeah. <sighs> she would have been good. Jefferson, Buccaneers and the Falcons. They would have been fun. They, I would have loved to have Buccaneers, but the thing I really needed was a blooming gannets. No no reduction. Uh, we... My parents met while working at the BBC. Daddy from the camera microphone. Mum behind at 900 Productions. Cool. There's a whole discussion going on about the importance of gaffers. I will just say they are very, very important from my experience. Jeff Hiller. Lee at Sema with modern with the modern battleships would have been interesting, especially when you think about the what the DDs and DDs accomplished. Yeah, he'd probably... He could have well turned the trap back on... Uh, it could have turned into a real trap and a bushwhack for the Japanese. I'm curious how... Mm -hmm. Rapid Razorback, does he even have a book? Not really, no. I've tried to put a whole section about her in my book. And there's a section about her in Martin H. Bryce, but that's about it. Jeff Beeler. If he used radar gunfire, Lee, uh, radar gunfire, Lee would have had ended up shooting at the biggest gun splashes like Zarego. Uh, Spotter aircraft would have been more useful. Probably would have managed that, but also he wouldn't have had to... <sighs> Let's put it this way. Uh, the these and all those are doing their action. The carriers are withdrawing. If you've got battleships there, do the carriers only need to withdraw behind the battleships? Because the battleships will hold the line against anything the Japanese chuck them. They will do. So destroyers can go fully offensive, the carriers can concentrate on operating aircraft, and the battleships can go, you want to get through us? Sure, Mike. Uh, the USNBBs versus the RNBBs in a night action. Well, as I said earlier, if I was looking at it, I would go in the beginning of the war, I would give the advantage to the Royal Navy due to their preponderance of night fighting, especially up to 1942, because they had been doing so much of it prior to then, already in the war, but they'd also been doing it pre-war. Pre but after 1942, when you start to have radars come in that are actually practical for fire control and actually good for fire control, then it goes to whoever, who gets, whoever gets the first shot in, basically. So, uh, what would your dream project be, Mr. Clarkson? I've danced around a bit, but still seem to be wavering good stuff. No, no, that's fine. Um, dream project. Probably World War II destroyers and all the things they get up to, or maybe the Falklands, but World War II destroyers would be quite cool. Especially the one how they get what they're getting up to in the Eastern Fleet. The Eastern Fleet would be a great one. If you're forgetting the British Pacific Fleet is forgotten, or the army in the jungle of the fourteenth army are forgotten. They are nothing on the British Eastern Fleet. Eastern Fleet gets ignored completely. Mondoc, uh, Ducks Clark, modernized Victorious with Sea Vixens and Buccaneers. It would be Phantoms and Buccaneers at that point, but yeah, that would be lovely. But, mm hmm. No, I, so. I find it funny as uh, much as you talk about Michael Clapp and Amphibious Warfare, he did a lot of naval aviation. That he did. And that's quite common for the time. If you think about it, that is quite common for a naval officer's career at the time, in, well, in that period. And that's the important thing. That's what sets the fleet air arm apart from 
the RAF and the other things because you have to go off and do your ship time because you have to understand ships as well as the aircraft to be able to use the whole mixture per, uh, properly and that that's the thing it's and that's not bad because the RAF don't need to okay they don't need to do that that is uh, so they don't do that they go off and do station command and other sort of things like that the Royal Navy, instead of having the staff posts, have the ship command post time, which is why, is why they have less staff, not usually as good as staff officers or experienced staff officers, but they need that for their roles. It's the culture and it's a difference. It's not better or worse than, uh, better than one or the other. It's just different. Very sassy. Maybe you should pitch it to him. He's got more creative freedom now of Amazon. Hmm. Tempting. Um, favorable chance of Mr. Clarkson and Dr. Clark getting uh, hired out of the dock for a walkabout filming. He did that. Uh, he did have a PBR built from scratch, after all. Eastern Fleet needs a DD for a setting. Ooh, that would be good. Jeff, you see a lot of switching around. Jeremy Larkin, the clap, uh, Jeremy Larkin, clap, flag captain, came from a submarine. So the two of them had all bases covered. Yep. And you have two of their officers come are anti-submarine warfare officers who've come into the amphibious warfare side. So, you know. That's the thing. That's what's going on. Right then. So, let's get into some things. So, we keep talking about battleships. So, this would seem to be appropriate. The Red Knot by Robert McKay Massey. Um... It's one of those Marmite books. It does have some very interesting pictures and some very impressive moustaches. But there are problems. It's not well, I wouldn't say anything in here is too bad. It's just some bits are not as good as they could be. It's worthwhile reading, and it's it's one of those things which does really show how you get the diplomacy of both the movements of naval sh of ships and the movement or the development of the technology factors into things. It's a good book. Rapid Razorback. Any destroyer captains try to use a cruiser like a destroyer? Well, not so much. There were a few cruiser captains who tried to use their cruisers like destroyers. There is a classic example is the Battle of the River Plate. Another book for today. Dudley Pope's Battle of the River Plate. It's a good one because it does go into naval diplomacy. And I could have got out the Ambassador himself's book, but I didn't fancy it. I thought I'd get out this one, as it gives an overview, and it's not quite so personal, so it's a bit objective. But basically, the whole battle plan that Harvard uses at the River Plate is a destroyer attack plan, break up and attack from multiple angles. It's not really the cruiser playbook, but it is what the destroyers do, and, well, according to World War One history and according to German understanding of it, Is it? The good cat doctor might try to steal Hyder for his personal yacht, but we shouldn't give him ideas. I wouldn't take care of my personal yacht. 
houseboat, maybe, not personal yacht. I like using KGV as a cruiser in World of War uh, Warships. Hmm, cool. That is fun. Chef Beater, Hyder is an old retired lady. She does not go for walks anymore. No propellers either. It is work of moments. I would get... Trust me. Suitably motivated and with Amazon's bank balance. Yeah, I'd get propellers fitted to her again. I'd get her moving. Might even get her pump jets. See how fast we can make her go. The thing is, if you are going to read Robert K. Massey's Dreadnought, then you also need to read this book. Clive Pointing, 13 Days, Diplomacy and Disaster. And basically, all the errors that people like to point out in Dreadnought are corrected in this book, and all the problems with this book are corrected with Dreadnought. So read the two together and you get a good analysis going on. Someone's rebuilding a new Titanic. That would be disturbing to me. Yeah, Narvik would be a good documentary. Narvik would be nice. Narvik will be an interesting battle to look at, and we give you a lot of different content. Tad Thompson, uh, Hood is fun. It's fun using as a battle cruiser, especially with a Fiji and battle battle cross flanking. I don't know why they have her listed as a battleship in the game. I have no idea why she was a battle cruiser. Jeffy, let be treated to build a new tribal cl uh, like Clarkson of PBR. Could mount 4.7 inch guns like the original. Uh. I like that idea. I like your thinking, Jeff. I, I do, and I think I even have a yard in mind to build her. I'm sure Camelads would love to churn out a tribal class destroyer. Danny from Staff Thompson, there isn't an explanation of battle crews in World of Warships. That would explain it. Although, why not? Right, so. This book is something slightly different than non-books I would normally be talking about, but it's quite a cool book and it's worth reading. It's called Reorient. It's Global Economy in the Asian Age, and it's by André Gunder Frank. Published in 1998 by the University of California Press. It's worth reading to understand some of the factors of the modern and global economy and some of the issues which are faced. We recognize that country? And if you want to have start understanding some of the issues we are facing now in Southeast Asia, in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea, 
in the broader Pacific and Asian economy, this book is definitely worth a read. So if you're interested in getting to behind why certain things are happening today, and possibly what informs some of the assessments I might be offering on bilge pumps, this book is well worth a read. Jeff Beeler, Narvik or Norway in general cannot leave out Glowworm and the also defense of Sinking Blucher. No, no, no. You'd have to talk about them as part of the context. The full battles of Narvik, you know, it would have to be context. Mm. That's Clark. Have you read Prisoners of Geography? Yes, I have. It's a good book. Not sure I agree with all of it. This is why I have slightly different ones here. Um, if I was going to recommend a book rather than Prisoners of Geography, I have A World of Who's Making. Making the International Economic Interdependence and Political Order. Edited by Simon Bromley, Maureen McIntosh, William Brown, and, and uh, Mark Witts. It's colossal. I would say say it divorces some military power from the things, but it's produced by Luto, Pluto Press and the Open University and it's published in 2004. It's well worth a read. Don't hear me. So when we, I, that would be a dream, but I doubt it'll happen anytime soon. Take care, old Richard. Thank you. No. Uh, by the way, uh, just before anyone manage it, worries too much about this likes appearing, I do appear to have picked up a... I'm calling him my friendly troll, because he li actually left a message the other day which said he thinks everything I do is terrible, and he only watches me so he can tell me how bad I am. And so I'm calling him my friendly troll, but I do wonder if he doesn't have better things to do with his life, because that seems to be rather, I don't know. If all I was, if I didn't like someone that, I didn't like what someone produced, I wouldn't watch them. I'd go and watch one which I do like and do be interested in. It's why I never understand it so much. I don't mind you, you know, if you watch it once, you don't like it, dislike it, go, I don't... Don't keep watching others and dislike them. That seems like a waste of your time. Ah, well. <laughs> Rapid Razorback. Any good destroyer-driven naval fiction? Oh. Not really. Most of it isn't as fictitious as it might make out. Quite a lot of the books I have are fictitious in only... It's like there's one which is over there, which is Lower Deck, which is technically fictitious, but it's only fictitious in so much as they replace the name of the warship in it with another one to make it a thing. Thank um, It's uh, Mr. John Walkley. I think his name is from memory. Let me just check. I'm sure he's commented again on something.
Yeah, John Walkley. He does like to lead his messages. A very civil troll, yes, in the nicest way, but that's it seems rather... Mm. New IKB4472, have you read Why Nation is Small? Yes, but I'm not the most keen on it. Strup, Doctor, do you think shipping containers will change how convoys in a major war worked? Because ports can only unload so many ships at a time. Also, the number of commercial ports has decreased. I think that would make things slightly more complicated. Because container ports have to be that massive and have to be that specialized to down the, to unload containers. Uh, it's going to increase your your issues of taking containers off. And ships can't offload themselves, which they could do to an extent in World War II. Um, so, you know. It, it will make things more complicated and difficult. But some of us have built up years of learning how to fight trolls playing games like D&D and watching Shadversity on the subject. I have had lots of fun in the nicest way. Um, it's going to sound strange. I'm a university lecturer. I teach history of engineering to engineering students. I'm used to being in a room with 600 people who, especially in the first lectures, don't want to be there, don't see the point in being there, and would rather be doing anything else, especially something mathematically based, rather than someone talking a load of words at them. So... It takes a lot more than saying you don't like my stuff. I, I just feel... Unlike those students, he's not paying to be there. It's not part of his course. He's not getting grade on it. So it's more a case of I don't understand why he's putting the energy and effort into it that he is. Rapper is it? Could you convert tribes to light cruisers? You'd have to do a lot of work. They'd have to grow a bit bigger, a lot bigger, a lot, lot bigger. They are light, light cruisers, at best. But they're really they're fighting destroyers and they're back pocket cruisers. Papa, evening, doc. Definitely not watching in the bath and pretending to be a submarine. <laughs> Oh, that sounds good. I keep threatening my girlfriend when it's very, very hot. I'm going to do a naval history live from the bathtub. And she's basically banned me from doing this, as has my mother. Um, both of them are wor equally worried about this circumstance. I, I, I am surprised they do not share phone calls to try and be sure that I have not yet tried to do it. And... Jerison, maybe he's a student of yours. I doubt it. Honestly, most of my students, when they have problems, they email me straight away. Uh, no, my, my, my students mostly just want to either like me and enjoy the stuff I teach them or want to get through my classes as quickly as possible so they can get away from me and the topic, basically. Yeah, it's fine. Right, so... Here is a random book which I've added to this list because, honestly, I couldn't think of anywhere else it would go. Now, this is The Making of a, of a Civil Servant by Lady Murray. And it's about Oswin Murray. 
That's Oswin Murray, GCB, Secretary of the Admiralty, 1917 to 1936. Let me repeat that again. Secretary of the Admiralty, 1917 to 1936. He was in post for 19 years as the senior civil servant of the Admiralty. You think about how many directors of naval construction there were in that time, how many first sea lords there were in that time, how many third sea lords there were in that time, how many second sea lords, how many pe different people went through it. This man was the head of the civil service of the Admiralty for 19 years. And this book does not disappoint you. Now, you don't get that type of structure in the civil service anymore. It isn't. It's around the modern hiring and HR policies. But frankly, the making of a civil servant, and it's he was writing his own autobiography, and then he died, and his wife finishes it off as a biography. So it's written by him and his wife, and it is... It's an amazing book to read, his entire career, what he gets up to, his family. It's like that other book I showed you earlier, Diplomats of Duty. Um, it's, it's just, if you're interested in what's going on in the Admiralty, if you want another layer of what's going on, of who's who and what they're doing and what the realities of civil service and of the bureaucracy behind organizing navies and foreign policy in the 1920s and the beginning of 1930s and the end of World War One is like this guy. This book was published by Mufin and Co. Ltd. London in first published in 1940. And this is a, a this is a first publication. In fact, this is. Mm -hmm. uh... And it has this quote in it: "The making of a civil servant was written before the outbreak of war in 1939, except for a few omissions of now inopportune material, a slight addition to chapter six." And a few notes, the book is unaltered. The ranks or titles that are mentioned are the ranks or titles by which they were known at the time at of which I write. Later ranks and titles will be found in the index. My most grateful thanks are due, due to all my all my the friends who have helped me in various ways towards the making or producing of this book. That's by Mildred O'Mari. And this is from Admiral Sir John Kelly. Uh, the passing years did but increase my affection and intense admiration for not only the finest brain, but much more for one of the finest personalities, one of the finest and straightest characters I have ever known, by Admiral Sir John Kelly, and the greatest man who did more for the Navy in his time than perhaps anyone else, Admiral Sir William Fisher. And it goes through his time with the Geeds Committee and all the things he deals with as he goes through his life. It's a really... It's a really, really cool book. And it's a really interesting thing. And it's... There are so many people in it. It's trouble. This is one of those books. Which you just. Can't put down. This really is a cool book. Sorry. Getting distracted. I found a picture in here. From King George V's funeral procession. Left to right. Sir Oswin Murray. Admiral Fleet Lord Beatty. And Admiral Fleet Sir Henry Oliver. That's what the Secretary of Admiral's uh, of the Admiralty's garb was like. It's a, it's just, it's something that's so, it's so cool. Uh, let's see. 
New IKB four four seven two. What are your disagreements with why nations fail? It's linear. It's too linear in its thinking for me. It's a good i. It's a good argument. It's something to think for and put your mind and uh, get your mind thinking. And I would give it to students as something to get their minds thinking. But as a theory, it is too linear for my own personal taste. Mondok. Nah, I'm a uni lecturer. I didn't downgrade anyone. I did all their marking, coursework marking, and it's all... Well, I honestly, I did the marking, and it was all fine. Um, there are some people who complained about their grades, but honestly, those people, when they came back to me, weren't pointed out that they... They failed to fulfill basic criteria as set out in both my lecture, which they'd failed to attend, and the course book guide, which they had failed to read. So that affected their grade, and they were surprised by this. Rafa, is it? Thoughts on the Atlanta class group and given that the main battery was five inch en masse. Um, it's a super destroyer. It's like the Dido's. You're building super destroyers more than cruisers. Rafa, is it? I agree with them. No tubs. That's just terrible. Not bad. Then follow up to Der Rafa, is it? For Dr. Clark. No shower filming either. <laughs> <laughs> Concentrators must have been good at bureaucratic infighting. It is a very cool book to read. I do not know where, how many copies there are around of this. I haven't been able to find many. Uh, it took me 18 months of hunting to get a decent copy of it. And this copy, believe it or not, belonged to the National Library of Scotland. And basically, it came up for sale, and I pounced on it. In 2014. 2015, actually, it came up for sale. <laughs> That's what senior citizens are lucky to make 19 months these days before they move to another department. Yeah. Juicy decision. Oh, well, I forgot this was on today. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Juicy decision. Jeff, good evening to Clark. Ben Labour, it's very nice to have you here. Rapid Razorback, don't mess with civil servants. They aren't limited by chain of command. Nope, and we're you in the eyes, so we're entirely truculent. Mm. One of my students was upset with his grade, but my contract was up, and my supervisor just gave it to him so he didn't have to fill out the paperwork. Uh, yeah, to be honest, um, uh, the trouble with being the sole history of engineering lecturer in the history in the engineering department means that no one really wants to argue with my grading i'm considered fairly fair as well because i block out exactly for the engineering students what they need to do and what marks will be for that uh the students who are marked down didn't use harvard referencing because that's what they're required to do by the department i prefer vancouver or chicago but the department requires me to, me to teach harvard so i teach harvard for them, and I expect them to use it, and uh, didn't do research and didn't do, uh, they just use Wikipedia and all sorts of things, so they lose marks. And then there's a, there's a minimum writing amount. One of, my assignment is quite cool because it has no maximum writing amount, so you can write as much as you like, but it has a minimum. The minimum is 2,000 words. Maximum is as much as you like. Usually students end up around about the four and a half to five thousand mark word marks. I find that quite nice. And the assignment is to pick uh, ch to choose any two or three engineers or surveyors, etc., from your hi from history who inspire you, and compare and contrast them, and say what lessons you can take from their experience to further and develop your own career. Which I don't consider a particularly onerous assignment. And they get six months to do that. 
So we do. I set the lecture at the beginning of the first year, within a couple of weeks of term beginning, and they get introduced to the librarian. They get periodic extra lectures with me as they go along, and they have to submit it in March in the following year. Hmm. Jerison, Harvard referencing rubbish. Agreed. I hate it because it's in the text. Jerison, the first year of uni is always the hardest. Once you understand you have to go to the brief and now to reference, then it's easy. Oh, great. All right, Rachel, you should send your reading list to a digital press. You have expensive taste in books, and I have to keep at least one kidney. <laughs> 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 Oh. Jerichan, I can only name one surveyor and one engineer from history, George Rossington and IKB. Actually, do you know who the most famous civil engineer in the world is? This is actually one of my um, engineering profs I work with occasionally, his um, favourite joke. Most famous civil engineer in the world? Osama Bin Laden. Yeah. Decision. Teaching proper referencing and how to research build arguments is such a basically neglected area of education. I know. That's why the engineering employment employs a historian. Literally, my role is history of engineering, but basically it is teach them how to actually write an argument and actually make an essay and write reports. Uh, Chicago is usually my favorite, but I get used to doing Vancouver because I do a lot of online work these days. It's very small. Chemists tend to become heads of government. Well, there was Margaret Thatcher. Right. Back in a second. I've been drinking a lot today, though. But I'll be back in a second.
Ah, yes, the one on the reporter. Yep. Merkel also was a scientist. I think she was a biologist. Um, don't know if more political leaders are trained as lawyers, though. In the UK, we are get, getting more coming through who have only really worked in a part of political machinery. That's quite common these days now. And Jerison, I thought it was someone's brother that was a civil engineer. Both were. Both did the, uh, the training. Uh, Zoom has one in law. Lee Cake has one in economics. Yep. Jimmy Carter was a nuclear chemist or engineer. I forget which. It's trouble. Just thinking about how easy your assignment sounds compared to writing memos on why business the military. The whole point is it's in a good way for first years to get an introduction to their whole field, to wander around it. And to try and teach them the context of the engineering, because one of the issues we find is that if the students go through and all they understand are the processes and the formulas, they don't understand the concepts and the context of when those processes and formulas started to come about. They don't understand the full picture of what those processes and formulas were for. So there is some reasoning behind it. Rapid race work, firm barrack naval shells. Only if you allow me to fire them from a 16-inch gun. Go on, Nicole. Mm. It'll work on unarmored ships really well. That is true with thermal barrack shells, but it also work quite well on any sort of unarmored unit. Hmm. There are nuclear rounds in the USN, ASROC rounds and nuclear depth charges. No kidding. Doesn't surprise me. Uh, gentlemen, giving sources simply uh, my work, simplify my work, giving marks a short text on geography in high school. You don't give any sources or write textbook as one mark goes down a notch. Hmm. Gentlemen, as I said, usually at the beginning in the first class, seven, 15 year olds, write in what you used. You use Wikipedia, write it. But this exact site, not whole wiki, you write that title of the book, not library. Yeah. Same wasn't anyone else uh, anyone see Hamster's documentary on that? Very impressive boom at the end. Yes, there was. Um Rapid Razor. IKB, that's overkill. Too much fallout, no pun intended. Yep. I agree nuclear engineers are seen uh, nuclear weapons are uh, our area denial devices, and the whole idea of war is to exploit enemy resources. Areas in our words. Yeah. So, Doctor, I was listening to Bill Trump's episode with the Commodore. Do you think military organizations should have continuing education history classes for enlisted officers? Yes. UK IKB 2. Have you read The Red Devil and other tales from the Age of Steam? Uh, not recently. No, I don't think I have yet. Um, Dirt Squad. A friend of mine was studying law. They were told to stop citing R.V. Smith when they'd forgotten the class because... The case because the PhD students were getting angry looking for non existent cases. <laughs> I have um, one friend who, in their exam, spent the whole time uh, in a history exam quoting from Dr. Shipman because that was the mo that was the name which kept going through their head. Of course, Dr. Shipman was a GP in the UK who decided to kill his patients, not a historian. So, uh, yeah, they didn't get the marks they were hoping for for that. Um, Rapid Razorback, your book confuses me. Is it about ship design, roles and missions, or stories of insanity in gun and torpedo fire at 30 knots? Um, I will go Juicy Susan. Why not all that? It basically is all of that. It's the whole scenario. It's trying to bring everything together. Operations, engineering, all the stuff that was featured into the campaigns and into the fights. It's a little bit on the um, it's fun. It is fun. 
Right then, so what books have we got through and what books haven't we? The ones on this side, we have done. The ones on this side, we have on. So, Jeremy Black now. Because I'm going to finish at about 9 o'clock, I reckon, looking at the Iron Brew. Yep. And, um... So I'll take Poppy for a walk. So, Jeremy Black's... Britain as a military power, 1688 to 1815. Um, Rutledge published 1999. But uh, 2004 by Rutledge. Um, it's pretty cool. I'm not the biggest fan always of Jeremy Black's books because... Sometimes I think he makes them complicated for the purpose of making them complicated. But this one's very well laid out and very well written. And I think also that's possibly his approach is just sort of slightly different styling to mine. But I do like this one. The plan, a plan of Louisbourg to show the siege of 1758. Devoting attention to the landing sites, the plan, ca uh, plan uh, captured the importance of the Army Navy cooperation in the amphibious deployment of British striking power. The publication of the plan testified to public interest. National Maritime Museum in London. It's a pretty cool operation plan they had. Wilcox, the interconnectedness of all things. The more you learn, the more tangled the web becomes. Yep. Emmon, I'm reading about the 1918 influenza, and I was wondering how badly the Grand Fleet and the High Sea Fleet were affected by it. Did it potentially influence the sailors of the H uh, High Sea Fleet to mutiny? Yes, it did. It reduced their numbers and influenced them to mutiny. The Grand Fleet were also quite well hit, but also... You must remember, the Grand Fleet were further away. So the Grand Fleet were up at Scapa Flow. Which is just that bit colder and just that bit further away. It does get hit, but by no means as badly as other places do, which are close to things. Um, Jerison, I was accused of fabricating sources on an assignment, just a 200-year-old book. Also, I know someone who owns a house owned by Harold Shipman, although he never lived there. Ooh. Ah, Raparosa, I need to know. I need to know how you worked Dale Brown and Douglas Adams into your PhD thesis. Dale Brown, Douglas Adams, and also uh, Terry Pratchett, Tom Clancy, and J.K. Rowling, from memory. I think I also got some Antonia Fraser in there as well. And Jeremy Clarkson. Yeah, can't forget that. Um, Strub, Doctor, is the book still on schedule for being a perfect Christmas gift? Well, in some reports I've been told it's been put back to spring, and some reports I've been told it's still on for Christmas deadline if they make something. I think they're putting it back to spring at the moment officially. Unofficially, they're still hoping to make Christmas, is what I'm getting my opinion in, impression, but I'm not sure. I'm going to hope for Christmas. How the literal strike ships are going ahead. Mondok, heard the literal strike ships are going ahead. Meant to be merchant ship conversions. What's your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts are I'm tempted to do a video about the subject and different options. So I'm going to leave that to that side. Does it have details on, you know, the Adriatic campaign in World War One? before I forget? No. But I might be making you very happy on that at some point, Carl. I might be making you very, very happy on that. Um, plenty of people in my year of med school had medical parents who had worked near the shipment's patch and signed off some of the cremate. Ooh, what a fun. Was reading an interesting article on the role of deception in Chinese military. Could be fun on the Bill Trumps to examine if South China Sea is a large misdirection effort on their part. I think the misdirection on the part is if 
it's how you approach the South China Sea and the installations. Is it conquest by civil engineering, i.e. the claiming of territory by building artificial islands? Is it the dispute of territory, or is it the exercise of power? And as such, why would you be exercising that power? Are you doing it into be... How do I put this politely? Are you doing it to show how powerful you are? Or are you doing it to show how powerful you could be? I usually like to look at the missile systems which they mount on those air bases on the islands and the rings around them. And honestly, the number of missiles, etc., things they're carrying, they're no threat to the US Navy. The US Navy could stomp over them in seconds. Um, the whole US military can. Those islands just don't have the logistics and the supply yet. They don't have the infrastructure behind them. But they are scary for their neighbours who don't have the resources of the USN. China, this uh, Bill Trump's this week will be about China. It is another China episode. So um, watch out for that on Wednesday. It will be another China episode. Rapid uh, raise back. Anyone do naval diplomacy, then go to work for the Foreign Service? Uh, well, honestly, the... James Cable was a diplomat. He was an army officer who became a diplomat and then wrote a book about naval diplomacy and gunboat diplo and naval and naval strategy. So um, yeah, interesting person. We do. We limit. Our, try to limit ourselves to once a month on China. We try to limit ourselves to once a month on China, unless under uh, specialist circumstances, because we want to talk about other things. Admittedly, though, we got told we didn't cover the French enough in the small navies. Mm -hmm. That's the South China Sea Islands are China testing waters if you print out, uh, pardon the pun. They want to see the reaction of the West to aggression towards other countries. Hong Kong is similar. Mm. To an extent, yeah. So Thompson, just a small side set. How have you saw the landing craft museum post I shared on your general Discord page a couple of days ago? Yes, it was cool. It's going to be very interesting when it comes into uh, when it comes in. Especially as currently the Royal Marines don't have a museum. Because it got closed down based on getting a new museum and then they haven't had the new museum built. Ah. Jerison, the value of those books, as in the probability from the data, is worth millions and gives the organization I work for a strategic edge. Hmm. Cool. Uh, Reverend, but on the subject of China, uh, peripherally, what about naval diplomacy, natural resources? There is so much of that stuff happening. Um, Concentration, doing historic research on the South China Sea powers is excruciating at times. Need to know too many languages and sources are hard to get. You can say that again. This is from, have you read the Space Captain Smith? I just remember they existed. Uh, I can't remember. 
Go on, Eagle. Dr. Clark, love your bill trumps, but your previous episode on South China Sea was horrendous. Um, China was horrendous. Hope you consulted a right source for this. If you mean, did we consult the Chinese government's propaganda sources, aka the China Global Times? No. And also, please, I know it. it, it is the solid thing of the Chinese Navy, but the amount of reports and stuff I've read, political officers are not the executive officer. Well, if they are the XO, then you've got a big problem going on here with your in the nicest way. So I, I'm just don't get into that one with me, Golden Eagle. And yeah, I, I'm harking back to my experience when Chinese ships visited the UK and having met them. No. Uh, Strub, Doctor, who has the most to, uh, to lose if China controls South China Sea? Japan, India, Vietnam, UK, or US. Name anyone. All of the above. South China Sea is a very, very important trade route. Unless you can go around it, that's a problem. And also, there's the fact it sets the precedence for you to take... Uh, let's put it this way. There is the globally agreed economic, economic exclusion zone, which is 200 miles from your shore. If you allow the precedent to exist that someone can take any reef that they randomly claim, develop into an island, and then draw a line 200 miles around and go, this is now our territory, imagine the precedent you're setting. That's the trouble for China. Yes, it looks great in an idea, but actually the precedent they're setting is very, very problematic. Because also, even if that does work, what happens if America starts doing that to them? It's just not a good idea. Don Gasbert, read Chinese rock versus exit game. Uh, when you have an island that is not really sinkable, but one can ship in additional launches quickly. Artificial islands are different in again, and uh, you really hope you have very good quality concrete for them. Hmm. About a week or more ago, I read an interesting discussion on Facebook that drawing circles about to show Sam Rangers is in reality more disinforming about their true capabilities. Radar is and how high, low. Yeah, it is. It is very disinforming, but it's an interesting thing to see as a Ford experiment. Jerrison, you talk about China and South China Sea, but nothing on Iran and ongoing Homo's stripping crisis. We do talk about the Homo's. We do talk about the Straits of Homo's quite regularly. And honestly, it's fun dealing with Iran. Listen, oh, okay. As a non China build trans episode, if South American powers. Stop trying to compete with each other? How would their use of naval power change? Seems historically to only be about ego. Honestly, they might start actually thinking about South America as a naval power and as a naval presence on the world stage. But as it is, their own thing is more important. Um, go on, Eagles. They spent three quarters of the entire episode talking about political com commissars without realizing political com commissar is simply the XO. No, they're not. Sorry, they're not. Um, <clears throat> Come on, Gasman. When you're accusing China of dirt for dirty games, it is okay as long as you acknowledge that everyone is grey, dark grey. Yes, the world is not black and white. It's grey. Shades and shades of grey. Gradually getting darker more often than lighter. So I'm glad you saw it and thought it cool. You made my head snap with the Royal Marine comment, then finished the statement and was better. Hmm. Ram Braceback, Discord is having a small war over which publications are and are not worthy of inclusion in discussion. There's so many things worthy of inclusion. Daniel Freeman, Carl Gasman, Sinking Island is where you need the other Dr. Class in the house. In that house. Yes, well, yeah. That's the interesting thing. My sister's a geotechnical civil engineer and basically looks at him and goes, 
you sure those things are going to be there in 20 years' time? Yes, I chose my words carefully. Not really thinkable is not way is not a way equals thinkable, unthinkable. Yeah, that's the thing. They are more difficult to, but if you hit them in the right places, by gum will the C do your work for you. That's right. I'm thinking with the new new viewers, another no one is a, a saint speech is needed. Well, if that's the case, in the nicest way, welcome to the real world. No one is good. No one is bad. They tend to have interests. Nations have interests. And sometimes they'll do things which are very good or very bad because those are in their interests. There are all sorts of fancy phrases which come around to support it or say it's a good thing and say, we're helping out of the goodness of our hearts. But this does mean that when it comes in future, we're negotiating a trade deal and we want to sell you things, we're expecting to have a f far gooder, far nicer um, perception of us or our equipment or the quality of our people and the, the, the things we leave behind. Okay, that's not bad. That's a nation looking after its own citizens. It's like, People accuse China of being evil or these people. They're not evil. They're just doing their own, carrying out their own worldview and their own way of looking after their citizens and their governments. And basically, that's it. Just stop ascribing them emotions or instead of intents. Just look at them as what are they doing for their interests. And you'll often figure out them far easier that way. Rapid Ray is back. How small can a ship be made and still be a viable military diplomatic tool? What do you want to do with it, military and diplomatic wise? Do you just want to be able to position a white, a white ensign there? And where do you want to send it? A river class OPV is perfectly useful as a diplomatic tool in the English Channel, or as a fisheries protection vessel, or as something wandering around Gibraltar or the Falkland Islands. But if you're talking about going through the South China Sea, I prefer to be in something a lot bigger and a lot better armed. It's the context of the operations. What military operations, what diplomacy do you want to do? That makes a big impact on what size ship you need. Mud Guy 8829. What do you think of the U.S. Marines trading their tanks for ship anti-ship missiles? I have a feeling there'll be a direct fire version of the APC procured. But it'll just be far enough away from the tanks that people won't consider a replacement for the tanks. A strub. In the EZ, countries have limited legal authority. I fear the public doesn't understand the difference between EZ and national waters. So, here's the thing. National waters, <clears throat> roughly about up to 12 nautical miles, basically are your national territory in that they are under your control. Your law holds writ. Anything beyond that, it's international law. But according to international law, within any EZ, you have, within your exclusive economic zone, you have exclusive economic rights and administrative privileges, which means that is your territory to administer. You decide what happens there in terms of exploitation of resources. This is why it matters. This is why suddenly when you're looking at the Falkland Islands and you're looking at the Pitcairn Islands and the United Kingdom on a map of the exclusive economic zones, it's a very, very different question. And actually, I have the map somewhere. So let me flash that up quickly on the screen so I can talk about this.
It's always fun to try and find these things sometimes. That one all out. Right, I'm going to disappear for a second, so. Right. This is the United Kingdom's ec exclusive economic zone. So, when you're saying what does Britain need to worry about around the world, when you're talking about global interests around the world, this is a global interest. Those are all the British overseas territories, which it technically administers through the local territories um, things. But if you look at the England, uh, the Europe uh, exclusive economic zone of the UK alone, you look at those great big bulges going around, uh, around the island out to 200 miles up into the North Atlantic towards the Arctic Circle, all these things. That is there. So this is what an exclusive economic zone is, and this is what you need to. This is what when you talk about you have to control. So this is what is around the world is British. Then there's the Australian one, and one of the reasons I like this map is because if you look carefully, you can see all the stuff, but you can also see all the portions of the world which is currently unadministered. And that is the really scary thing because. Actually, that unadministered area, those areas which are not administered at the moment, could well be soon be administered. They're talking about expanding easy out to 400 miles, out to all sorts of things. That's going to make a massive difference. Emin, I may have asked this before, but what are uh, Spain's legal case for the ownership of Gibraltar? It seems the Treaty of Trek is pretty clear cut, or is it just posturing? Posturing the treaty of uh, the basically uh, they want to reverse the treaty of retract, but then they don't want to do what the other things which come with it. They're claiming it was done at the point of a gun. It was done after a war, which, to be honest, the Spanish had started. Uh, per the uh, podcast, the official reason Finland does not have submarines is due to treaty restrictions from the 1947 Paris P talks. I know, but honestly. It's been 73 years. They could have got around them now, theoretically. But I can also understand the point as, you know, it, to be honest, we wanted to have that debate. So we set that one up a bit because uh, we had that discussion ourselves beforehand. So that was sort of a bit of an artificial debate in some respects. The problem for Spain over Gibraltar is that they look a bit two-faced having enclaves in Africa. They have all sorts of... The Spanish one is an interesting one. Uh, let's go see if I can find a Spanish easy. There you go. There's Spain. Up comparison. Slightly more concentrated, but ultimately just as dispersed in terms of islands and things around it. No one actually need, no one needs those. I don't think American Marines would fit them even if they wanted to do. Uh, those are BTRs, I'm presuming, BMDs. Okay. I'm assuming they actually have contingencies for the Falklands and Pitcairn now. Last time they didn't cost them. Falklands, they have one of the largest air bases in the world outside of Europe and North America. Uh, and the idea is you can fly everything in quickly. 
Uh, I'm never quite sure about that. And especially having, you know, there is the reason that the A400, which is the new, a new one for the RF, can, I think, to carry two boxes and their um, accoutrements takes three aircraft. So I'm not sure how quickly you can actually deploy stuff by air. So I, I hope they have something heavier to be able to deploy by sea, which is why I find the literal strike ships to be a bit silly um, and a bit light. As for the Pitcairn Islands, <laughs> they have no landing strip. They have virtually impossible beaches. Um, getting there and doing it would be very difficult. Getting there and doing it for anyone would be very difficult. But there's hardly any people there. In Jerison, if you think something belongs to you because it's next door, then you just the occupation of Ireland and the UK claiming Fair Islands. You justify a lot of things if you claim if your entire claim for ownership is proximity and might is right. Jerison, the easy uh, easy around Cyprus is one of the most complex in the world. Yes, it is. It's really, really mucked up. Bird guy, do you think that we are really reliving the late 1930s again, and do you see things going hot in the Pacific? I hope not, but I do worry about it sometimes. I think we're more in the late 1920s than the late 1930s. I think the late 1930s, the 1930s are still to come. Seeing as Cold War ends in the early 1990s, and then we have a weird sort of period of 10 years. Then it sort of starts to look, everyone's talking about disarmament and everyone's talking about getting rid of the weapons and all these things. And the Western nations are still talking about disarmament 30 odd years later, but they're starting to talk about buying new equipment and more high tech gear, but not more forces, more high tech gear, not more forces. And at a certain point, you're possibly going to start hearing about increases. <laughs> Thank you, friend. Britain really should have kept Menorca. It would have been fun. That's good. Gets worse when you ask Turkey, Ooh, or and most things get worse when you sort of ask Turkey's impression of things. Like China, they had, they are the heirs to what was a humongous empire of both informal and formal empires, so they have claims to pretty much anything they can manufacture if they want to. Jerry, um, mm hmm, bravo. If things go hot in the Pacific, it'll be weird. Nobody has the navy to fight another trans Pacific war. No, everyone will be building one rapidly. That's good. Each time you say EZ, my uh, brain goes to the R and EZ tradition of winding up your mates. Well, spinning dits is fun. Uh, Stuff Thompson, uh, the clock. If the boundaries become 400 nautical miles it's, and still under Commonwealth maritime rules, uh, yeah, the UK would have roughly half the North Atlantic, 800 nautical miles combined. Of, yeah, uh, 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 it gets very, very interesting. If you have that, uh, if it gets increased to 400 miles. And let's not talk about the sort of the basically the South Atlantic uh, one islands and their EZs join up at that point. Danny Freeman, uh, I'm not going to I have no idea. I don't think they are um, that inbred from what I've read, but um you're the doctor. You go and check. <laughs> Martin Doc, Daniel Freeman. Are they not the? Uh, are they not the descendants from the bounty on the Big Ken? 
many, many different things. Rapid Razor, since China is playing carrier catch-up, where are they relative to the UK and US? More interesting, where are they relative to India? Um, I would say they're about a decade from having what we would consider proficient carrier arm if they keep pushing at this pace of development, but uh, I wouldn't count on them not, them not thinking they're viable before then. There's a difference between having a proficient and a viable carrier arm. A viable carrier arm is the majority of your operations 70% of the time go well. A proficient one is it's 95 to 98. Um, we'll catch them. I was viewed a Pacific War as a, or as a commerce raiding campaign, more like Germany versus Britain than Japan, rather than Japan versus the USA. Could be. Doctor, how quickly could nations expand, given the, that I recently read an article that 80% of high school seniors are disqualified for one reason or another, mostly physical condition? Well, you know you have to start a physical fitness program. Kind of like the British government is doing now, post-COVID, with everyone's got to get fit. You then start, and for myself, actually, I would love to. I am... Um, I know I am bigger than I normally am. I know at the moment I'm quite larger than I normally am. Normally, pre-COVID, I was in the gym or the pool every single day of the week. My body has, because of COVID-19, because of shielding my family uh, to protect them, not been doing that. And honestly, road running and me are not good friends. And I could only go out once a day anyway, so it was walking the dog. <sighs> Because also jogging with a two-year-old dog is not fun. He's lovely. He's bouncy. He gets very excited. And you manage it for the first 200 yards. And then he's trying to jump around you and all these things. And you can't keep a constant pace and all these things. So you don't do that. Although I do have a jogging lead for him. And the shoes necessary. But um, so it's a case of when my, bi uh, when my exercise bike finally arrives. Well, hey. But. They are all. They're going to start fitness programs, and then they will. the The thing will be in to get you before you. They'll expand the joining program basically, so there'll be four weeks fizz before you actually start the assessments. So there'll be four weeks, about a month of them beating everyone into shape before they can get before they start it. Rapid Razorback, what about naval diplomacy in the Indian Ocean? Oh, that's a lot of fun. Indian Navy is pretty darn cool, uh, cool but very upset with the Chinese Navy at the moment. That's good. From what I've seen and experienced of the Chinese Army, viable for China is a lot lower level than the West. Five ten of our orienteering treasure hunt was seen as a praiseworthy. <whistles> and the typhoon warring, uh, roaring overhead and made the whole panzer, the whole panzer column race a cover. It takes an hour to reform it. That's forcing your enemy to deploy. Rear guards serve the same purpose. Yeah, it is. Basically, it's a mission kill versus a natural kill. Hi, Frederico Vega. William Cox. India is certainly a respectable regional pair. Uh, Rarison. I haven't gained any weight, but my muscle is now flab. Too much on wireless cape. That. This is also the thing. This is another thing for me because I'm at home with my mum and my sister and me, and we all like to bake. We all like to cook. And my mum is 
I don't. I am never going to. You never do get out of the stage where you are, as far as your mum's concerned, a growing child, and you need to be fed. And I think both me and my sister have gone. We love you, mum, but the food keeps on appearing, and it's like. Also, I've always been taught, and I don't know about everyone else. This one, uh, if it's put in front of you, you eat it. You do not waste food. So, food gets put, and it's a couple of rounds of sandwiches and a piece of cake. And an apple. And you have breakfast, and you have that, and then you have mum knows, and then you have your main meal, and. So much food heading my way. Trying to cut it down there. Bridget Gavega, I was wondering how you plan to do your live war game in Toronto. I have plans. I have cunning plans. It basically depends. If I can get... <sighs> Me and my sister are currently working on a way of how to structure it so that we have enough money to pay for our offices. And basically get the cabins built in the garden. Um, we've got it all worked out. I think my sister's planning on taking a loan, but I hope she doesn't. Because so, I hope to, uh, to be able to provide enough, uh, some more money myself. I don't know where I'm going to get it from, but I'm... Working on that. I might have to apply for a credit card or something like that. Um, but leaving that to one side. That would help a lot. With terms of organising that. Because then I would have a space outside the house. That I could have Drac come over to. And I could set the things up. And we could work it that way. Because it would then. he wouldn't. Uh, we wouldn't even have to go in each other's houses. Uh, it would be an external, and he could walk in the garden and get yeah, that. But that's the thing. And then I put Jamie on a big screen. Do Strub, Doctor, do you think nations will draft male and females equally? It would seem fair. I believe in equality. It would seem fair, but we'll see what happens. There is always the politics which will affect things. Short answer. 11 generations, 200 years to the European mutineers. Where does the Pelagian wound? Six. Ooh. That's good. What do you mean they don't know about the second breakfast? There's an uh, right. Uh, rapid race back. The people who taught you about food went to the same school as the people who taught me about food. Yep. Jerson, twelve thousand pounds will get you a decent log cabin. Six thousand for a large shed. Uh yeah, that's roughly. We're talking uh, to get it built to un all built and installed, and also uh, we are planning on. Putting in a few things such as access for my mum, so it's a no step access to all the garden so she can get in. Because if we're going to have the work done, we're going to have to have a lot of concrete put in to do a concrete base anyway for the um, cabin. So we might as well have that put in so it's step free access for her to go or to walk around the garden. So I think we're sort of thinking about. A little bit north of your figure, Jay Richardson, but not much off, oh, north of it. To get electrics and everything laid in, and um, hardwire phone, uh, hardwire internet connection. But that's going to be quite a lot of money for me to, uh, to uh, sort of organise my share of. I'm not sure how I'm going to do it. Uh, that's the trouble with not having, because normally I would have Justin Craig, and that would pay a hefty chunk towards that, but don't have that this summer. Um, and we've been told we're going to be working at home for probably the 18 months, the next two years. So, yeah. You need the office space. Then here, happy to offer my place of venue. Just me here at the moment. Or it's a great opportunity of, uh, for proper double blind play. <laughs>
Bad guy, would the US and allies come to aid if India if it goes to war with China and Pakistan, or does the US just watch the fight and then see the conflict go nuclear as India gets overwhelmed? That's the question. I have a feeling they would come to support of India. Especially if China was the aggressor. Sturgeon, the UK had equal kind of description in World War II. Women went into the land army, ATS, AA guns. My grandmother was an army, um, dispa uh, armed dispatch rider. Yes, and some women were flying um, support aircraft and aircraft between factories. And then the Soviet Union had completely equal uh, conscription. So I have a feeling it's going to be the standard. Um, yeah. Rapid uh, race back. Any stories of naval diplomacy that can be summed up by descendants if you sink me, if it, get, it gets very bad for you? Singtao and Asamamaru incident. Staff Thompson, book advance. I'm glad they, that you're squaring things off for what appears to be a prolonged, won't share my views on the Wu flu, but being proactive is always best. Uh, unfortunately, the book advance won't be that much. Uh, the book advance, I got paid £500 at the beginning, and I'll get £500 at the end. That's all you get for a book these days, is about £1,000 advance, especially for your first couple of books. Until you're a well-known name and your book orders are guaranteed to be in the tens of thousands, if not double that, you are not going to get more than a grand. Especially without an agent, and you're not going to get an agent if you don't have a couple of books. So, um, that won't pay it. Right. So, it's... I'm almost out of iron brew. I'm going to call it a day because I can hear the fluffy research assistant making a noise, and it is currently dry. It stopped raining, and I don't know how long it's going to do that, and he does need his walk. So, I'm going to say thank you very much to everyone, and if you do you have any final questions before I go, thank you for taking part. Thank you, Frederico Vago, Francis Fault, John Emmett, uh, Greg Starsky, Daniel Freeman, Sean Mack, and Daniel Freeman. Thank you very much for doing the um, admin stuff. Derp Squad, William Squad, Cox, Rapid Razorback, New RKB4472. Uh, William Cox, I think I said thank you to you, but if I haven't, I'll say it again. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Carl von Gasberg. Thank you, Stephanie Wilson. Crowdfunder? I don't think I'm that popular for a crowdfunder. I don't think that'll work. Yeah, I can be full sim too. Yeah. Bud Light virus? Oh, good lord. There are all sorts of weird things coming out. Hello, Yikers. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, everyone, for turning up and watching. It's always a pleasure to have you. And I hope to see many of you tomorrow for Singtail Live. Take care, Stafford. Hi. Thank you, Paul from Chicago. Thank you, John Evans. Thank you, Jonathan Smith. Take care. Thank you, Adam Crow. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Take care.